the next lecture will be given by Bar Mark Abram. Mark currently is working for Intel and is associated with uh, the Stockholm Gromax team and uh, with the SciLife Laboratory. And uh, he has been for a long time, I don't know how many years. Mark, do you have an estimation? How long are you Gromax developer? Uh, depends how you count it, at least 12 years. At least 12, huh? about 20. No, not 20. Not 20, 12. 2012, so exactly like Magnus you start. Yeah. Something. yeah, so he's also, so he have been a Gromax developer since he was a PhD student in Australia. And then he became a Gromax developer manager, actually, and he moved to Stockholm. And that was in which year? Do you remember? 2012. 2012, okay. 2012, he moved to Stockholm and he was a Gromax developer and he has been working as a Gromax developer. I will try to, as a, sorry, a Gromax manager up to, I try to guess if I'm wrong, 2019, I guess. I'm okay. I'm, I guess correctly. Yes. And then it was going on for different, in different direction. And then he went back to Intel and he's still working on Gromax. In particular, he has a, a special attention for GPU and CPU performance and enabling good performance in Gromax. And today we'll speak about Gromax structure interface. I'm very happy to hear your talk. Please go ahead, Mark. Okay, thank you for that kind introduction, Alessandro. Can people hear me well? Yes, I think I read from Alessandro. Yes. Okay, yes. wonderful. So yes. The first topic in, in the, the workshop after the break is going to be uh, on Gromax structures and interfaces. And so we're going to be looking at, at a high level at some of the, the, the crunchy details that go into how the Gromax code expresses what it is that we need to do in order to have a, the, the highly capable uh, molecular simulation package that, that is Gromax. And some of the things that, that make it special and some of the things that give it challenges uh, and, and how we are trying to handle these challenges as as time evolves because Gromax itself as you know has been going for more than 20 years um, and it's a very different code now than it was 20 years ago and we hope it will be a very different code again in another 20 years and we are changing all of the things within and around Gromax so that the the, the scale and the usefulness to the, to, to the simulation community um, maintains its relevance. Processes the, and structures in the code that used to work 20 years ago no longer work now. We are slowly changing them so that we will be where we want to be uh, in, in another 20 years. So on with the details. As an outline of what I'm going to talk about over the next hour and a bit, um, I'm going to remind some of you and perhaps teach some of some others of you uh, some workflows that are, are common in using Gromax, because I will refer back to those as I'm talking about some of the structures we find relevant to Gromax. I will first talk about some of our repository structure so that those of you who are new to the code base have, have a little bit of a, a feet wet situation going on uh, so that we, we know where a few of the things are. There's an awful lot to find, but we, we need to start somewhere. So I will start with that. Um, and then I will talk more about some, some relevant structures, particularly in, in MD Run, which is the, the main simulation engine within Gromax. I will talk some at some length about some of the internal interfaces we have within Gromax because those are frequently where new contributors to Gromax can have the best value for their learning, uh, knowing that, ah, there is a place where I can interact with Gromax that's going to have relatively low friction is, is a great thing to know before you start trying to find where to, to change Gromax. There's a few other tidbits and a couple of ideas for, for hand-on exercises uh, at the end for those who are keen on them. So on with the workflows. Um, Software always exists to be used. That's one of the big challenges with it. It's never done, it's always changing or it's not being used. Uh, there's there's, there's, there's two, two facts of life for, for software. And because it's being used, that usage really needs to be reflected in the, the, the structure of the software. And, and so it is with Gromax. We'll look at some of these usage patterns because we need to have them in our minds as we, we learn about some of the structures so that we, we have some context for, for how these might be being used. Um, 
So uh, one of the the first workflows that the new user of Gromax uh, come across is the the workflow of the the so-called Gromax preprocessor. Uh, so this is is something that's uh, an extremely valuable part of of the Gromax simulation engine. Those of you who are familiar with with other kinds of of high performance computing codes or other kinds of molecular simulation packages, we'll see different ways of of, of doing this that have have different strengths and weaknesses. Um, but we're we're a big fan of the way that the Gromax process or preprocessor or ROM PP uh, works because it gives users and developers a, a, a bunch of, of key key advantages. It can be very tedious using other kinds of packages if you have to compile into the software how you want the inputs to your simulation package to look. You, know, you have to build a different version of the, the code uh, if you want to, to run a different simulation system. And there certainly are codes out there where you have to do that. Um, my colleagues at Intel deal with a lot of them. Um, and it, it can be a bit challenging. Whereas there can be big advantages for being able to express your simulation input distinct from how you compile for running on this fancy high performance computing machine. The way we do it in Gromax, we can leave all the fancy details about how to install Gromax for best performance in the hands of the experts uh, at, at simulation at uh, high performance computing sites. Uh, and you can just worry about your science things. So that, that's one of the principal advantages of this preprocessor. In order for that to work, or indeed any form of input to, to work, you have to provide information to the simulation engine. Uh, and so with Gromax, we do the majority of that, what we call Gromp time or pre-processing time, where we need to, to give a file containing the particle positions and maybe maybe some velocities, maybe we generate those, maybe a bit of extra state about you know, status of, of internal algorithms and stuff, maybe a, a file that describes where's the protein, where's the solvent, because I want different algorithms to work in different ways according to them. All of that needs to be input to, to what we call the, the simulation state. There's a data structure we'll talk about a bit later called uh, T-state uh, that is built at Gromp time uh, initially, and then serialized into a, a portable binary self-contained TPR file. And this TPR file is structured so that it can be read the same on any computer on the planet, because we do a whole bunch of software engineering behind the scenes to, to make that true so that your laptop will read and write the same file on any big simulation computation engine you might be using on be it Google's NWS or your local supercomputer site or the biggest sites in the world. It will all work exactly the same. Other kinds of inputs are also needed to, to make a simulation work. We need to provide initial values for lots of parameters like how constraints are going to work or how temperature coupling is going to work. So all of those tend to go into to MDP parameters that are supplied with the minus F command line flag to, to Grumpy P. And there are some components to the force field as well um, that mostly go into what we call module inputs. So there's a, a legacy data structure called T input rec and its replacement, which are a key value tree uh, contained in MD modules, all of which I will talk in more detail about later. However, there are a few aspects of MDP parameters that for good and bad reasons also contribute to aspects of the state or to how the system topology gets interpreted. So Grom PP needs all of these things together in order to build these more or less separate components of the TPR file. Uh, but uh, yeah, some of the things are a little bit intertwined and over time we, we, we try to improve that separation where possible. Finally, the, the last major component of providing Gromax input is uh, the system topology. So that can be broken up into the molecular topology that describes, okay, I have a protein that has this sort of bonding interaction. I have solvent, which might be water, and it, it, it looks like this. Maybe it's got three particles, maybe it's got four or five, depending on how you as the user want to set things up. And maybe I also have other things like sugars or a lipid membrane or counter ions, all, all sorts of interesting things can be present. All of that is described in the, whoops, molecular topology. Also, all of those atoms need to get named. Uh, and so it's quite helpful to describe this molecular topology in a hierarchical way, because you might have a protein that is a multimer. So we have several copies that are the same. Very frequently, if you have a solvent or uh, a lipid membrane in the system, you'll have many copies of, of this chemically identical molecules. We describe that efficiently in a hierarchical topology that says, okay, here's my definition of a molecule type, and I want six copies of that molecule type in my system. However, when we go to express the atom names, all of that is written out as, as a single structure uh, in a single file because of the, the historical way of, of how many of these structures were submitted to databases like the Protein Data Bank, uh, where there, there was a, 
a complete assembly of how the biological system works. Because we're frequently uh, simulating the kinds of systems that have been seen in biology, working with the, the, the file formats that were already present in, in the PDB uh, is why the, the coordinate input is structured differently from the molecular topology input. And there can be a few other weird things here, all of which go into the system topology, and all of which get serialized with this TPR file. So this, this is a quite common workflow that people get used to, to, to using when they're preparing simulations to run on Gromax. Uh, and uh, I'll refer back to, to this kind of workflow as we look at some of these data structures a bit later on. MDRUN is the, the next major component of MDRUN that, that people uh, using Gromax for simulations become familiar with. You can see an example command line up here where we, we call GMX, maybe it might be called GMX MPI uh, if you're wanting to run on, on lots of computers. Uh, we say MD run for the simulation engine, and then we give it a whole bunch of command line options. So we have, there's a flag here um, with the minus sign that, that says what uh, what kind of file I'm going to be giving next, and here's the name of the file, and there's a suffix that, that describes to MD run what, what sort of file format that's actually in. And so some of these take different um, file format options. And MD run's job is to synthesize the user's input, have a look at the hardware it's got available. And decide okay yeah i can i can run the simulation i'm going to put this piece on a gpu over here and this piece i'll have to run on the cpu here and put all that together and try to run it in an efficient way and let you know what's going on and when things are done it incorporates a bunch of different engines for doing like dynamics or energy minimization or test particle insertion different kinds of qm in them all kinds of stuff can be orchestrated by this same uh, simulation engine so it's got a lot of capabilities behind it which means it can do a whole bunch of different things which means as Code developers and code contributors, we need to have thought carefully about all the different kinds of use cases and, and levels at which we need to express different kinds of things that are going on um, so that everybody's code can live together and, and collaborate together. Inputs to MD run are chiefly on the command line where we describe what kinds of file inputs will be coming, the file inputs themselves, some of which are the TPR file, which we built at GRMPP time, and one of which might be a checkpoint file. And frequently, this is written by MD run during a previous stage of the simulation. And you might have had to stop the simulation because the power got cut or your simulation, uh, your high performance computing allocation ran out of time and you have to, to, to start again. Uh, so MD run is able to, to take a checkpoint of, of where it's at uh, so that when you want to restart the simulation from the same point, you can provide that as additional context that replaces some of the information that was present in the TPR file. In that TPR file, these three components we looked at for GRMPP get deserialized, blown, blown back out into the, the same data structures in memory that were present at GRMPP time, except that the state is can then be replaced by some of the things that are, that are read from the, the, the checkpoint file. And exactly how that works depends on which of the, the parts of MD run are actually working at the time. Later during MD run, um, the different modules that are built uh, can participate in writing different kinds of output. So there's a, there's a text log file um, that, that uh, people get used to, to looking for to see, did the, did the simulation progress? Were there any red flags uh, about correctness or performance that I, I want to think about? There's different kinds of portable binary trajectory and, and energy files that are, are, again, quite useful to Gromex users because the same file that you wrote on your big HPC cluster can then be read and used on your laptop later, uh, which is very convenient. Uh, you know, copy the files back and forth once, but you, you know it'll it'll work the same no matter where you, you, you interact with it. Similarly, at the end of the simulation, um, an updated checkpoint file gets written. It's basically serializing the contents of the state, plus a few bits and pieces that might be coming from the module. So I probably should have another one there. And also there's a final simulation configuration written to a, a, a coordinate file, which can be really good for, for quickly loading your molecular viewer to, to check that your, your simulation is still looking a bit sane um, before you, you spend a whole bunch of compute resources continuing it. Um, so that's that's a, a, a helpful thing that, that Gromex writes out for you. Strictly speaking, it's a duplicate of the, the checkpoint and what's in the directory files and energy files, uh, but this is a convenience for uh, the end user. Once we've run our simulations, frequently we have to do some analysis on them. And so this can often take the form of looking at the different uh, configurations that were sampled uh, in, by the simulation engine as, as time progressed, and looking for interesting aspects of the, how the, the molecules we arranged, 
maybe what kinds of potential energies they had in these rearrangements, uh, if we're trying to construct something like a free energy service. Um, and so we have a whole set of analysis tools that are embedded in Gromax. So there's about 20 sort of pre-processing pre and preparation and, and observational tools, and about 70 that actually look at a simulation trajectory or energy file or both together uh, and try to produce some downstream analysis so that you as the simulation user can have some insight into what did I learn about the configurations that are accessible to this particular Gromax simulation. So we have um, what is called the trajectory analysis framework or the, the, the TAF. Um, and of those tools, maybe about 10 or 15 have been ported to it. And we are slowly porting more of those to that. Because one of the things we recognized uh, about 15 years ago was that frequently one of the things people wanted to do with Gromax was to add a new analysis tool. Um, and that there were there was a lot of copy paste going on in the, the analysis tools that people had contributed. And we wanted to try and reduce that so that people building analysis tools didn't have to think about a whole bunch of busy work of how do I make sure this comes in from that file. Analysis tool runners really want to think about, okay, at this analysis frame, I want to do my particular operation that I care about for, for the, the atoms in the simulation system that I want to analyze. Maybe I only work, want to work with a subset of them. Cool, I'll, I'll predefine that to uh, a framework that could just give those to me and I, I don't have to worry about making sure that I only work within the subset and allocating the right amount of memory and all, all that sort of, of um, trivia that we would like to take out of the hands of, of Grimax developers. Uh, so this framework um, sets up a lot of data structures and provides access to more powerful information if you need it so that the, the tool writer has fewer things that they need to, to worry about. So frequently, uh, a tool like, say, the, the, the Sasa tool is, has been rewritten with this new framework. It uh, analyzes the solvent accessible surface area um, for a solute that the simulation user defines when they call this module. And they often provide input such as the TPR file that ran the, the simulation so that Gromax and, and the, the end user's analysis agree on, on how things were looking. Um, a selection to say, okay, where what is the solute and what is the, the solvent so that where that surface area is is, is well-defined. And a bunch of other options that, that, that are specific to, to how we do solvent area accessibility analysis. And of course, the, the portable trajectory files that uh, are being analyzed. And so the person who develops this code has to, to, to make sense of all this and, and declare some code that needs to be run at the start of the analysis or when there's a new trajectory frame to look at um, and perhaps also when the analysis is finished. They also configure the, the analysis runner that is what will actually do the monkey work of reading the trajectory file in multiple different formats and deciding whether uh, the contents of that trajectory format are actually suitable for the analysis module. So the analysis module declares, okay, I need velocities and positions, for example, and if the trajectory analysis runner observes that this trajectory doesn't have velocities, well, it can give an error to the user right now to say, hey, this trajectory can't work. And, and the person writing the analysis module doesn't need to think about further oh, correctness aspect to you know, do, do the velocities actually exist. So they will then build trajectory frames that actually conform to the expectations of the analysis module. So those are in a data structure called TTRX frame, uh, and then provided to these callbacks. So analyze frame will get one of these frames and the person who implemented analysis frame or Sasa will then build up some data structures that may be being contributing to, to, to a file that's being written at every analysis frame. And maybe there'll be some summary statistics at the end that will also get written out. And so that'll build up a data structure that can maybe have a running average that gets finalized during the, the finished analysis call so that this analysis data structure can then, then be used to, to, to write some final output as well. So this is a powerful framework that uh, gets extended as, as we find new things that should be added to it because you know, we we looked at some of the, the common use cases, but we didn't try to port everything. And so we want this to reflect what, what people can do. So if you're trying to build a new analysis tool, please look at this framework. And if there's something missing, come and talk with us and, and we can discuss with you how best to, to, to meet that need. Maybe it's already there and you haven't found it yet. Maybe we need to extend it. Um, maybe we should do something else entirely. Uh, but the, the key, as always, is, is to come and talk to us before you go and write a whole pile of code and perhaps get lost in things. Often somebody else has grappled with your problem before uh, and they can help you move the right way efficiently. Before we start looking at some of the, the structures within Gromax, I want to give a, 
a scary warning perhaps um, of how one should not try and structure a tool. Um, and Gromax's trajectory conversion called, tool called TRJConf is a glaring example of how code should not be structured. And, and we can un start understanding that by simply looking at the first paragraph of, of the documentation. So Gromax documentation is always uh, freely available on the web. We, we update it every time we make a new release. Um, often it doesn't change a lot, um, but you can look at the release notes to, to find out what has changed for making sure that you don't you know, have to go and look at a whole bunch of documentation each time just to see if any of it's changed. Most of it doesn't. Um, the description is an immediate red flag. TMX ChurchConf can convert trajectories in many ways. You can go for one format, or you can make a subset, or you can change the periodicity, or you can reduce the number of frames and the number of particles. This all sounds like a really powerful and useful tool, and it is. But it's trying to do too many things. If you're trying to change the periodicity representation and change the timestamps and select certain frames and maybe put it in a different size box, well, ChurchConf will let you do all of those things. But you as the user don't have a good handle on, hang on, in, in what order do those operations happen, right? If I'm changing the periodicity and trying to keep things together, well, those are not entirely consistent operations. I, I need to know for sanity whether Putting the molecules together happens before I change the periodicity representation or vice versa. And church Chrome doesn't give you A, any knowledge of which order in which they happen and B, any ability to control it. So historically, people just came along and said, oh, this would be a great thing to add to church Chrome. And people said, yeah, that sounds great. And just added it. And here we are with a mess that actually nobody on the planet understands. And so often in, in a particular research lab that only deals with ion channel simulations, for example, they have a secret recipe for calling church Chrome, like, in four different stages that produces nicely formatted trajectories for analysis in their lab. But that's completely different if what you're doing is a coarse grain sugar protein interaction simulation because they have totally different needs about what makes sense to analyze in terms of periodicity and keeping things together. That sort of tribal knowledge of how to call church calls is tends to get lost on the internet at best, it's on some lab's wiki somewhere. At best, you only learn about it from the postdoc who left six months ago, and now you don't know why the postdoc did it the way they did it. Um, this sort of stuff we'd very much like to make better. So ChurchConf is slowly being improved over time uh, to become a composable tool toolkit where we have you know, input adapters and filters for frames so that if you want to drop a whole bunch of frames, you can do that. And then output adapters so that if you want to change the periodicity representation or only write one of the molecules, all of that can get composed in a way that you as the, the user on the command line can, can actually understand. Mm -hmm. So that's a work in progress. It's been going for a while. Um, a lot of it's actually been done, but still waiting to be able to find the time to, to, to internalize it mm -hmm. and update it. But frequently when proposing a change to a Gromax, particularly analysis tool, you might get the feedback, ah, this is starting to, to turn into church call. And, and this is the kind of thing we mean. We, sometimes it's appropriate to say, okay, we add this option. And if it's sufficiently disjoint from everything else the tool does, that's often the right thing to do. But if it's close to something the tool already does, then we need to think carefully about how to structure them together. Maybe we need to grow a new interface so that it can be understood how these things work together. Okay, so moving on from how Gromix gets used to how Gromix code gets organized. I'm going to look a little bit at the repository structure. Where do we look for different kinds of content and, and how should you try and find things? In the uh, slides, which will be made available to you already, if you go to uh, the Slack for the workshop or uh, hopefully uh, some other content that's available online for the version of this content that we'll upload at some point, uh, there will be uh, a PDF that contains all of these links. You can, you can click on these links and go to uh, parts of the Gromax documentation on GitLab online. Uh, so the top level docs directory includes a lot of very high level restructured text documentation. And so this is a great place to start if you're looking for something in Gromax and you want to get some sort of overview. There's a lot of very high level documentation there about things you find within Gromax. That documentation changes not frequently, but it is built nightly so that any changes that have happened are available to you right now. Um, you can also get that from the latest versions of the source code repository. Um, and uh, it's always available online. So that means that web searchers will be able to look within it. So often you can say, oh, Gromax MD modules, and that the appropriate part of the MD modules documentation will be provided for you 
um, via, via a web search. So we'll go and, have, go and take a quick look at that now. Um, so here it is. And so there are a bunch of sections within it. There's uh, the release notes to let us know, let you know what we changed lately. There's the installation guide to let you know aspects of, of how to install things. There's there's a user guide and there's a bunch of how-to guides. They, they give quite, quite overlapping pieces of information, but in a different format for, for how to get certain things done. There's a reference manual for people who want all the gory details of how all of the, the physics within Gromax is working. There's documentation for how some of the, the high-level interfaces are distributed with Gromax work to let you get things done in Gromax. There's also a low-level C++ API. There's a developer guide for how to do things that, that work with Gromax. So some of you will, will need to get familiar with that over the next few days. And finally, there is document documentation of everything. And so within that, there's a public API documentation, there's code documentation, there's full documentation, absolutely everything. Uh, and here within that, you will find lists of all the different aspects that, that have been written into the restructured text documentation I just miss, mentioned. Uh, so there's lots of stuff that's been written here. Definitely not everything has been documented here. And there's a whole lot of stuff that predates uh, use of Doxygen uh, that slowly gets expanded over time. Uh, but you can go in and, and look through other aspects and you can find a whole bunch of lower level libraries and, and aspects that uh, have got some documentation about how things work. Uh, you can also go in and see, okay, where I know there's a particular class I care about. So you can you can search through here and, and find things that are, are of interest. Uh, so all of that is available. Um, source files, functions, classes, all sorts of stuff um, has acquired doctrine over time. Some of it's been more useful than others. Um, your mileage will vary, but please do go and look because what when it, when what you need to change is there, then reading the documentation is, is a great way to get started. If you're considering writing some new code and hopefully later contributing it to Gromax, do plan to write your documentation as you go because that will help you as a developer organize your, your, your thoughts and remember what happens when you come back to your coding project after a couple of months um, and it'll be necessary for you to contribute it to Gromax upstream later on. There's a high-level uh, documentation, a uh, high-level repository directory called Share, which contains in it uh, a topology subdirectory, Share Top. Has a bunch of useful, fairly static content, like defining the default force fields that are present in Gromax and common topology building blocks like solvents and, and um, ions. Some standard water boxes that get used by some of the pre-processing tools to, to help you do solvation. Some things that help uh, fixing broken structures that are sometimes found in the PDB, like putting hydrogen in place and stuff like that. Uh, and a bunch of tables for the standard sorts of functional forms that, that can be useful for defining uh, different kinds of Gromax interactions. Key to, to some of how Gromax is organized is its build system. Gromax is built with CMake. Um, so most folders contain a CMake lists.txt file. And these are organized hierarchically, just like the, the repository organization is, uh, to let uh, CMake know how to, to build parts of Gromax, how to install parts of Gromax, and, and how things are, need to hang together. There's a lot of complicated detections of issues about dependency libraries and stuff that's, that's handled within these files. Most Gromax developers don't need to sort out a great deal of this, but if what you are doing is um, interfacing Gromax with a new library, like Colvars or Plumed or a new sort of trajectory output library like H5MD, then a lot of the stuff that you will need to deal with um, starts at uh, the CMake level. And so getting that organized well is often the first change that needs to be made once once you've written some code that, that is useful for, for doing your science and once the community at large finds it useful enough that, that we want to go upstream that into Gromax. And so um, CMix itself is a totally different and much better language than it was 10 years ago. Um, so if you're starting doing your CMake development, make sure that, that the, the documentation you're looking at from CMake uh, refers to itself as quote unquote modern CMake. Uh, there are books written for CMake 15 years ago that were wonderful at the time that are completely outdated now. Please don't use them. Um, do do try to use modern CMake. We have a pretty recent CMake requirement in Gromax, so you can use all of the fancy toys. Um, there's a lot of wonderful stuff that's that's been done to make build system management easier, uh, and we are making sure that we we adopt some of that over time. Uh, Gromax itself is compiled to C++ 20 in in the very near future. And we're going to be adopting things like C++ modules, which interact with, with CMake in, in highly desirable ways to make everyone's lives better. 
So please do try to do your code development in a forward-looking way um, rather than, than uh, using ideas that, that uh, have been improved upon over time. Code itself, um, because it comes from C++, is organized into source files and header files. And so the source files tend to be the, the majority of the content that has to get compiled by a, a program called the compiler that, that looks at the human comprehensible code and turns that into a machine comprehensible form. Uh, and the interface to those is, is often found in, in header files. And so these need to be shared between different units of code. So what goes into a header file and a source file is frequently the topic of uh, code reviews in Grumax. Um, sometimes we need to expose more in header files. Often there's more things in the header files than, than are desirable to share between modules. We want to have some header files that are useful within a module and some that need to be shared more broadly. And fewer still header files that need to be exposed in, say, a, a stable public API to Gromax. So we have different kinds of header files within Gromax that are doing different kinds of tasks. Uh, the last sort of form that is least frequently updated by, by newer contributors to Gromax are the very performance sensitive pieces of code that need to get reused in different source files. So we, we do use header files as well for those. Uh, but that's a very, very frequently unused case for for new new Gromax users. I saw that there was a, a question there. If if there are interactive questions, I'm very happy to take them. Um, I won't, however, be able to monitor the chat. So if perhaps one of my colleagues can can help me do that, then then I can take some questions. Yes. As we... So uh, up to now, there are no questions, Mark. I'm checking. Mm -hmm. And but if people, since people didn't know that they can raise and in the meantime, that is what you want. You would like to have question on fly that you mean? Yes, yes, frequently yes. There's, there's, there'll be something yeah. important that needs the context. Yeah. So please uh, raise your hand if you have something that you, if you want to to ask some something to Mark on fly, and I will interrupt Mark and uh, and unmute sure. you. So please Good. go ahead. All righty, I'll keep going now in the absence of, of questions asked or hand raised. Um, the next higher level organization, as I've hinted at already, is, is what we call a module. Um, and so this is a, a medium sized related, uh, group, group of source files and headers that have some sort of thematic relation. So all of the SIMD support code within Gromix is in one place, a lot of the GPU utilities are in one place, pre processing or topology code are, are all together in a, a, a source code module. And typically these are found under source slash Gromix. And so that, that's a frequent place to, to look for. A bunch of related code. So going there and looking for the sorts of things that are there uh, is, is often a, a good place to start. Once we have the code organized into these modules, let's follow that link, um, they interact with each other. We, we end up with what we call a dependency graph. Make this a bit smaller. Hopefully I can navigate all of the windows here so that you can see this. Zoom back out. And so we have here, um, you won't be able to read a lot of this detail, but this is an organizational tool for Gromix developers to understand how these modules are fitting together. And this is actually an example of a very typical C++ project where once it's grown large enough to need modules, suddenly you have a fairly confusing nest of this module depends on that module, which depends on the other module. And we need to be able to visualize some of this as, as developers to know where are some of the problems that arise. Because if we have the rat's nest of every module depends on any other, then any time we have to change anything in Gromax, everything in the entire world has to get recompiled. And as a, as a developer working on a day-to-day -day basis, that's extremely irritating. Um, you want to only be compiling the corner of the code that you're actually changing. You don't want to have to recompile everything just because you changed some header file. Uh, and so Understanding our dependency graph is the tool that the core Gromix, that core Gromix developers particularly can use to understand that, oh, this change is making the dependency graph worse. Is this a compromise we accept in the medium term so we make progress? Or should we take a step back and say, hey, we've, we've made this compromise a couple of times. Now we introduce a, need to introduce a new level in, low level interface so that all of the pieces of code doing the same thing can depend on that low level interface. Because the kind of graph we want to see is all of these dependency arrows pointing down to lower level modules, nothing needing to point up and definitely nothing colored in red here, which are links we've identified between modules where 
both modules are depending on each other. And so if you have both modules depending on each other, then you can't have recognizable levels in your software structure, which means no one can ever find anything and things will have to get recompiled all the time. And mo most importantly, you can never put a public API on it so that people wanting to do new things with Gromax don't have to change the core of Gromax. They can maybe live outside of Gromax. And so there's, there's a color coding, which I won't go into now because a lot of it is, is, is higher level that we can deal with in this introductory talk. Um, but we have here insight into where are our legacy modules, where are our circular dependencies that we need to relax over time, uh, and where are our good aspects that, that we're happy with. Not a lot of happy yet. And in fact, if you go back and look at this graph 10 years ago, it actually looks more complicated now than it did then because we've gone with some of these legacy modules that are that are nests of everything. We've broken out some of the things. So that immediately gives us more modules in our dependency graph and more lines between them. So it starts looking more complicated. But what we eventually want to have is more, more of those lines. So the, the existence of more lines is good. We want more of them to be pointing down uh, into a, a levelized structure. And so I will talk more about some of our attempts to produce this more leveled structure uh, as we, we talk more about some of the structures some of which are legacy and being replaced and some of which are, are the replacements that uh, we are introducing for the various functional reasons. Mark, could you please yes. uh, put in uh, in, uh, in this in the chat uh, the link to this page that you are showing? You can put so, also to me and I will post to everybody. That is this link in the slides. So if, if you want to follow one of my links, I, I suggest you get the slides from, from Slack. Uh, um, yeah, but uh, okay, I will I will do it. Okay, thank you. Um, higher level than modules, we have uh, what are called libraries. Currently, these are, are very closely linked to the files that get written to disk by the, the compiler that, that, that takes the, the source code translation units that the compiler turns into object files and assembles those into large groups of related code. So we, we have several of those in uh, orchestrated by CMake at the moment. Arguably, we should have fewer, but uh, that's, that's one of our ongoing tasks that, that we need to, to organize. And if you are writing a downstream project that wants to link to Gromax, then binding the API to, to libgromax and linking to it is, is uh, what uh, you will need to be doing. The various things found in the, the source code and headers, um, there are C style structures that lack what we call an, an invariant. Um, so typically that, that contains only a bunch of data that anybody could have read and modified. And because anybody can modify it, there can't be any knowledge about how the data in it is controlled. So anything could be inconsistent because nobody has structured private data that has an interface for interacting with it that says, yes, I will make sure that this is consistent in some way. So a typical example in, in, in Gromax is, is the, the T state data structure that controls the, the molecular state. Because there's no pri privacy here, you don't have any particular knowledge about whether the positions and velocities correspond to a nearby time step or not. They just could be whatever somebody dumped there lately. Usually people aren't so crazy as to lift them out of, out of consistency, but because nothing has kept them consistent, you as the end user of that data structure can't know that you are accessing velocities that are close in time to your positions. And indeed, in things like the leapfrog algorithm, it's important for you to know right now the other positions ahead of velocities or behind the velocities, because that's important if you want to write an algorithm that actually understands what's going on. Uh, so T-state gives you no insight into that because it's a struct that lacks the invariant of some declared thing. Classes, however, do have an invariant. That typically means they come with private data. And so one example of that uh, in Gromax is a thing called a padded vector. So this this wraps a C++ STD vector uh, and adds an extra invariant to that, but the data allocation has extra memory added to it so that we can do SIMD operations into it that won't address uh, memory that hasn't been initialized. And that will be valid to then do some SIMD operations onto it that then won't lead to either segmentation faults or code checkers giving you warnings saying, ah, oh, this could be scary memory that hasn't, hasn't been initialized. Actually, this piece of infrastructure has made sure that it is initialized and will be safe to use, uh, but so that the authors of Gromax code can just go and use it without needing to think about it, we provide this class with that invariant uh, so that you as the, the Gromax user can just go get your padded vector and use its memory without needing to worry about the fact that it is padded. Uh, so this is the sort of thing that can't be done with a struct. So 
as time goes on in Gromax, more and more of the stuff currently in a struct tends to get moved to a class um, so that it's easier for people to, to, to use. Gromax has a C heritage that, that we've sort of been changing over the last dozen years. Um, some of it is, however, still structured as a bunch of C free functions. Um, often that should be a method on a class or perhaps a collection of methods on a class. And you can recognize that pattern by looking at the, the, the first uh, parameter that is passed to that function. Typically that's, that's some C struct uh, that hasn't grown up into a class yet. And so things like the, the wall cycle timing manager, for example, is, is a, an example of, of this kind of infrastructure that, that uh, gets used. You need to provide timing for your class so that you can understand its performance impact. You'll need to call the methods on the wall cycle class as should be, but it doesn't exist yet. Instead, it's a, it's a free function. Also found in the source code repository are a bunch of tests. Those function at, at several levels. There are unit tests that are designed to test the correctness of a very small part of code, often within a, a module. Um, there are integration tests that, that test things at a higher level that might be on a whole module that contains a bunch of related functionality, or that might be testing the integration of several different kinds of modules. So you might want to, want to say, okay, can I checkpoint correctly across several different kinds of modules? And then lastly, there are end-to-end -end tests where we're running a whole instance of GRMPP or a whole instance of, of MD run, or indeed a whole simulation workflow together where we're doing the, the heaviest weight operations we can that tend to be kind of slow. So we don't want to run many of those kinds of tests. We'd like to test as much as we can at these lower levels because we can make sure they run fast. That they don't have to write files. They can stay in memory. That they don't have to use a GPU until they really want to. All those kinds of things. So we need to do testing at all those kinds of levels. None of them are bad. Uh, and often when you are thinking about Gromax development, one of the great places to start is to say, how can I think about testing for correctness? If I'm trying to write a piece of code in Gromax, to take a, an earlier question as an example, um, that can do uh, quantum mechanical potentials, how am I going to test that Gromax with a quantum mechanical, mentioned, quantum mechanical potential embedded within it is producing a correct result? I can't go and fire up a huge supercomputer to run my quantum mechanical code, maybe I need to produce some sort of canned results so that I can test the Gromax module on the queuing forces that are going to be being computed. Oh yeah, that'd be a great idea. That means I can keep my code in Gromax evolving using those canned forces without needing to worry all the time about, I can't test my code unless I can run on my HPC machine. So some of those questions about how to test should be driving how you think about your development process. So, do have a talk with that. Do talk about that with your, your supervisors, your more experienced Gromax co colleagues. Come talk with us on our, our regular Wednesday night developer calls where we can share this kind of tribal knowledge with you um, as, as to, to, to how best to think about testing your code. We have several different kinds of test data within in Gromax. Um, we have correctness tests where there's some sorts of truth about the code that you're running where it should be correct, right? If you're writing code to Square a value, well, you know that if the input was positive, then the output should be not less than the input. So that sort of thing can be trivially tested uh, for correctness. Sometimes how we need to compare the actual output of several different kinds of implement implementations in Gromax. Frequently we have a CPU implementation and a GPU implementation. We want to make sure that they're computing the same things, particularly in cases where we have different kinds of GPU implementations that are running on different vendor libraries on different compiler versions. We need to make sure they're producing the same sorts of output as each other and as the CPU. And finally, sometimes we need to make sure that the code produces the same version as it did in previous versions. Uh, and often those are, are frequently end-to-end -end tests because that makes the most sense. Uh, but we have a bunch of these tests that check that Gromax does qualitatively the same thing as it did in previous versions. We have two frameworks within Gromax that are implementing these different kinds of tests. Um, the one that is uh, to which we add new kinds of tests is, is based on Google Test, which is one of the industry standard frameworks for C++ testing. Um, those are found in a test subdirectory for each module, uh, and we embed within Gromax uh, a relatively recent version of, of Google Test so that you as a developer don't need to worry about solving that dependency to even get started with the code. Uh, and it means that our testing frameworks uh, online uh, all, all have a common framework from which to start as well. 
we update that every couple of years so that we make sure we stay on top of the, the new new capabilities that come into Google Test. <clears throat> um, and that's a, a quite powerful framework for doing all these kinds of tests. Gromex has built on top of that um, with a whole bunch of help stuff in source utils. Uh, I should add that to these slides. Um, that'd be a useful thing to, to have here. Uh, so things like integrating with end-to-end -end test data and so on has a whole bunch of helper functionality. Different kinds of assertions for is this floating point number close enough to another kind of floating point number to be regarded as correct? All that sort of helper stuff uh, can be found there. There is another legacy framework that um, predates our use of Google Test. We are slowly getting the tests out of this and moving them into Google Test. Um, in the fullness of time, we will delete this. We're not updating it. We will not accept new changes that add new tests here. Don't even go there. Um, just be aware it exists because we might need to think about some of those if they get broken by, by your change. Um, so they live in a separate repository, which is one of the things that's bad about them because now whenever we update the code, you might also need to update these tests and that's pretty tedious uh, and creates for creates a lot of friction. So that, that's one of the things that uh, isn't good about this separate repository. You as a developer can learn that lesson up front. You make sure that whatever testing you're planning to do for your code goes into your code so that when you run your tests, you have a correct version of your tests alongside your code. So that as your code changes, when you run your tests, you find out, oh, this test is now broken. Maybe I need to fix my code. Maybe I need to update my tests. Do that now rather than in six months time when you can't remember how your tests need to change in, in response to your code or vice versa. Okay, new topic. Uh, if there's any questions about structure, I would take those now, but I no, there are there are no questions up to now. Maybe people have a question, please raise your hand now, because now we are Mark is going to a slightly different topic. I mean still, but that's close the first section. So mm -hmm. just give one minute. So if uh, yeah, this Chris has a question. I will unmute you, Chris. Please go ahead, Chris. Can you hear me? Yeah. Cool. Uh, this is probably a pretty simple one, but you know, you're talking about checkpoints uh, before, and I was just curious: um, does the checkpointer, uh, the checkpoint algorithm, or whatever, does it run all the time? So that, like, if you if you lose power, uh, you can just jump right back in where that happened, or does that only write uh, at certain specified timings, like oh? only at the end or only halfway through. Just curious how that works. Uh, so this is something that, that um, Gromex users notice as soon as they, they start running their simulations. Every 15 minutes, uh, MD run interrupts what's going on and says to all the modules, hey, give me the data that you would want to have to recreate this moment in simulation time. Uh, and I'll write that to uh, a .ct on disk. And so there's there's structure in Gromex that allows you know, potentially new modules to, to hook into this framework so that they can add stuff to, to the checkpoint file. Uh, every 15 minutes, Gromex does that, writes to a new checkpoint file, and then renames the old file to a, a previous name, uh, and this is the newly written file as the current checkpoint, uh, so that if you have a power outage or your, your HPC job allocation runs at a time, you have at most 15 minutes worth of wasted time. You can choose that time interval differently on the MDR command line. Perfect. And yeah, and it saves the series of checkpoints as well. You can have it do that. You can have it do that, yes. Uh, Perfect. That tends to be really expensive in disk. So we don't encourage people to do it. It's not the default, but. It, it's uh, okay, so those files are kind of sizable. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. Okay. Thank you. We have another question. I mute Chris and I unmute. I allowed to talk. Peter. Peter, please go ahead. Yeah, so it's just uh, doubling back a bit to structs versus classes. Um, is there a preference to use classes with uh, automatic destructors and uh, getters and setters over simple structs, even um, for instance, say um, within sort of a private material inside of a module and not just public interfaces to uh, the rest of the code or But sometimes it's it's a horses for courses case. Um, if you have some data that's being frequently used within your within a particular module, then having a struct within its implementation that gets frequently used can be sensible. Um, 
even if you have got your module structured and it will need to be structured uh, so that it's interfaced to the rest of Gromix as a header file and, and that declares an interface to, to a class whose implementation is in a source file elsewhere. If you have several source files that are needed to collaborate internally to your module, then you will probably need to have another header file. And that header file might make the most sense to have as a struct. Um, that's a risky pattern for development width because if there are different kinds of state that your source code files are maintaining, then they can trip over each other when they don't know whether a piece of that state has been updated properly. And so this is the value that a another class gives you knowing that certain kinds of data have a relationship to each other. So I illustrated that earlier with the, the positions and velocities example from T-State. You, if you're implementing LeapFrog, you need to know whether your positions or your velocities are ahead of each other. Uh, and T-State doesn't give you that. Um, so if you're implementing an updated module, depending on the kind of errors you think you might need to make, you might want to build a framework that says, give me the states that were before this position uh, give velocities that existed before this position. And if those are available, it gives you to them. And if they're not available, it gives you an error so that you can't accidentally use velocities that or positions that, that don't correspond to, to what you expect. Whereas if you just have a struct, then correctness is on you. And so if you're the only person who's ever writing this code, maybe that's okay. Um, but if you're potentially contributing this code to Gromax for the long term, well, you aren't going to be maintaining this code for the long term. It's going to be a team of other people. Um, and they don't know all of that kind of stuff that's in your head about how to use it correctly. So at the time it comes to contribute things, sometimes some of these things that are in structs need to grow up because somebody coming along to review your code will see this potential and go, I couldn't think i uh, maintain this. Um, so that's where a class with an invariant becomes valuable because you can document the invariant, you can have tests around it, uh, and somebody coming along to change your code can look at the invariant and say, okay, that invariant, if correct, and I can see that the tests are passing, means that the bug is somewhere else. I can go and look at this stuff. Whereas all of, if all they have is a morass of state, bug could be anywhere, bottom of the to-do list, never going to fix this. And so we try to prevent that at code review time by saying, hey, let's, let's grow an interface so that we can um, have less state that, that's just piled on top of each other. Very good, thanks. Thank you. So I think, Matt, you could go on. There are no other questions as far as I can see. Yeah, Great. please, thank you. Okay, so now we're going to have a, a bit of a speed run through relevant structures in, in... Um, I will mention a bunch of things useful to hopefully many of you who I think you're changing something in MD run. A lot of it won't be interesting to all of you. Um, that's life because MD run is a big part of code. It does an awful lot of interesting things. There are a whole pile of things in MD run I will simply not mention at all. There'll be nothing about um, the performance data structures, there's nothing about SIMD or GPUs at all. Um, those tend not to be topics that people at an introduction to development workshop are, are going to be touching anytime soon. Uh, so I'm not going to talk about them. Uh, what we're going to be talking about are the, the high level organizational things of how do I add a new capability to Gromax? How do I change an existing one? Where do I want to think about changing the code? All righty. So one of the, the frequently changed things is simulation input. And so lots of software uses what are called key value pairs uh, to define their input. Uh, and frequently they take the form of some sort of text file. Uh, often those are written as plain text. Uh, sometimes these days those are written as YAML or XML or TOML or JSON or, or all sorts of other text-based file formats that are more or less machine parsable um, to describe this is how an operation should have happened. This is how an operation did happen. Uh, so that the history of, of what is happening can be understood and perhaps replicated uh, by somebody else down the track. So historically, Gromax did this in the, the MDP file. That stands for Molecular Dynamics Parameters. .MDP is, is its extension. Um, and it's a plain text file. You can see an example on the, the right-hand side here where we have a more or less cryptically named key on the left, an equal sign to separate them, and a value or perhaps a set of values on the right-hand side. Uh, that a tool like GromPP has to go and parse and say, oh, hang on, you've given me two values for the integrator. Um, I don't know what to do with that. Please go and tell me one value for the integrator because that's all I can handle. Equally, if you've you've said that the, the pressure coupling 
or the temperature coupling needs to work on several different groups, you need to give me a reference temperature for each of those groups. If you've given me a different number of reference temperatures, that's probably wrong. I need to kick that back to you as the user and say, hey, give me a number of reference temperatures that correspond to the number of temperature coupling groups you've said to use. I can't tell where your error is. Maybe you intended to take out the temperature group, but only took out the reference temperature. Maybe you added one and didn't update the other one. I can't tell what your error is, so I'm not going to try and be smart. Please help me to by describing exactly what it is that you want to do. Because in six months' time, you're really going to appreciate that when you haven't done the simulation that I guessed badly for you. Um, so that's why some of these tools sometimes seem a little bit nitpicky. Um, there might be a way we can guess, and where there is an absolutely unambiguous way to guess, Remax does have that as the default. It tells you what it's doing while it's doing it. Um, but in any case where there's, there's any sort of ambiguity, we, we kick that back to the, the user and say, hey, um, this is ambiguous. I don't know what to do. Please clarify. We'll all be happier if, if you do that. Um, so historically, we had single data structure that was built by Gromp that had all of the different keys for all of the different modules in a single structure. And this worked well for a long time in Gromax when Gromax was a single research group and all of the other developers were somewhere up and down the same corridor. Um, and it was pre well pre-pandemic time, so everybody came to work every day. You didn't have Zoom, so you couldn't collaborate very effectively if you were at home. So you knew if there was a problem, you could walk down the store and say, hey, what, what is this DT field? What, what, what should it do? Um, these days, that doesn't work, so we have all this documented online because most of the people who work in Gromax are in a different country entirely from you. Uh, so over time, we noticed that TN Prorex started to scale badly. If every module declares its keys there, then suddenly there's one data structure being included by every module, which means when somebody changed that, everybody had to recompile everything. Uh, and that's a bit tedious because it means you have to recompile everything, and then that's friction. You don't want to keep your code up to date with upstream Gromax if it means you'll then have to spend the next 15 minutes recompiling everything in Gromax. Now, oh, maybe you can do that if, well, I'm about to go for coffee anyway, so I'll just start a recompilation and come back later. That sort of thing can work. But now that means you as a human need to structure how you're working with the code and your flow gets interrupted. We'd very much like people to be able to keep upstream as much as possible so that they find relevant things that break sooner and not be interrupted by a whole bunch of irrelevant things that are changing. And so some other module changing how it's spelling its MDP file, it's completely irrelevant to your module. They should be able to update their module, get a, a commit through code review and, and have main branch updated, and you can pull main branch and not know anything that doesn't relate to how your code needs to change. Uh, so we're not there yet, but we are working towards it. What we are doing for new modules is allowing them functionality they can call to say, hey, I want to describe and you feel like DT, which is the simulation time step, it needs to take a floating point value that says how much time is corresponding to one Gromax simulation step. And I tell the infrastructure, here's how the name is spelt. Here's the kind of data I expect to take. Here's a default value. When you're reading the MDP file, here's what I expect to find there. Once you've found it and done all of the nasty stuff of checking that, in fact, it was a floating point value and not a string, give me back the value, and then I will do the stuff that is relevant to my particular module, because I might want to have detailed tests of, OK, is is the, the simulation time step conforming to particular expectations of, of the update module that I'm changing? So you, you can have all of that module-specific knowledge inside your module and all of the framework-specific knowledge about, has the user given me a string or a floating point number? All of that can live in the infrastructure somewhere. So that that sort of common error can be given back to the user. And you, as the module author, don't need to think about that. You can rely on the invariant of the classes of that are handling the input saying, you're really going to get a floating point number. So this transition is underway. Currently, we have the, a key value tree data structure that lives in the bottom of the T input rec. Uh, and as time passes, more and more of the standard modules get converted to this framework, uh, and eventually T input rec will go away. So you are strongly encouraged to, to use the, the new key value tree framework. Um, we can have a quick look at the electric field module example. I can use jump to a particular source code file. Um, so there are particular interfaces that are called to 
provide MDP options. So here are the ones for the electric field module. And they allow you to pr provide us field strength and you know, how, how often it should alternate and you know, the, these sort of things that are module specific and I've long forgotten them. Um, and a function that can be called back to build MDP output because one of the things that GOMPP does is that it writes out an MDP option file that's corresponding to what was provided as input, perhaps with some of the defaults supplied so that you as a simulation user know what all those defaults were in the version of Gromax that you used. Because over time, those defaults change. And so we need all the modules to be able to write out their own MDP input. And they need to actually be able to do something that computes the relevant electric field contributions to the evolution um, of the simulation. And the high level module needs to declare it's an MDP option provider so that these aspects uh, about MDP handling um, get declared appropriately. So those, those are here in these three functions. So there is elsewhere in Gromax an interface that says if you want to expose MDP options that are new to Gromax or indeed existing in Gromax, well, you need to define these three functions in your, your class. Um, and then you get called back with a particular data structure that follows particular rules, and you can go and call it in, in well defined ways. And what this means is that, okay, every module has to include the header that defines these sorts of data structures, but those change very rarely, only when we need to extend that interface. Each module that might be using this interface changes much, much more often, but you as a user don't need to recompile because it's a different part of Gromix entirely. Um, and so you can change the header file uh, very infrequently and the source files more frequently uh, in different modules and you developing module A are not impacted by needing to recompile module B um, more than one time. So th this, this is where the Nirvana we want to end up at, that every module will declare its own MDP fields. Um, no one needs to know about anybody else's, uh, and that um, we can, can expose these sorts of things uh, in, in, in ways that don't mean people trip over each other all the time. Another important structure in Gromex is how to deal with so-called message passing interface communication, MPI. Um, this is a detail hidden from Gromax for a while. When people start using Gromax, they, they tend to run on a single computer. And so Gromax has built in a version of MPI that is called Thread MPI uh, that provides the illusion of MPI to the developers while hiding the fact of this illusion very largely from the, the users. Um, because we need Gromax running on huge supercomputers to work the same way as Gromax runs on your laptop. Uh, so we, we have this abstraction within Gromax that provides this illusion. Um, the part of that illusion is a communication data structure called TCOMREC. Uh, there's a little bit too much in that. We've slowly been pulling things out of it that, that don't make sense to hang around within it. Um, so this is one of the reasons why when you start working with Gromax, start from a, a recently updated version and try to keep up to date because these things change. And if, if you're heavily depending on details of Comrec, because that's what your module needs to do, well, you will find that, that things will change over time and you'll need to refactor your code. If you kept up to date, then at the time you want to contribute, you don't have a huge pile of work in front of you. Whether you want to do that work is, is up to, to you at the time you want to contribute it, of course. Um, if you're happy with your Gromax version living on something that will slowly go out of date and won't run on the latest GPU frameworks, that's okay. That's, that's your prerogative. It's your time. Um, but keeping up to date is something that needs to happen if you want to keep advantage, uh, keep taking advantage of the other contributions that do happen to Gromax, the evolutions of performance and the ability to run on different kinds of GPUs and CPUs that keep coming along. So hardware changes, so Gromax has to change too. And we're doing our best to try to make sure that your code can live on, but it's a work in progress. Most people don't need to worry about this, but it exists. Similarly, uh, because we need the ability to decompose Gromax into pieces of work that can run on physically distinct computers, um, we need a way to decompose that. Um, Gromax decomposes into domains that are um, a physically compact set of particles within the simulation system that, that you've described to Gromax in the TPR file. This is an absolutely pivotal concept behind almost all forms of, of Gromax that runs on multiple ranks. Uh, each MPI rank corresponds to one of these domains. So periodically during the simulation, Gromax repartitions the simulation system so that each domain gets a spatial group that is again compact, because over time the diffusion of the particles means that the domains become less and less compact and everything becomes less and less efficient to compute. So every now and then, which can be around 
a hundred steps or so. Um, Grow Max rebuilds uh, things like the short range labor lists and any other module that says, hey, look, I, I need to worry about how far one particle is from another. They just give themselves a call back to say, hey, when, when repartitioning is done, please call me back because I need to update my own internal data structures. And so there is a, a mechanism to, to enable this callback. Uh, not all of the modules within Gromax use it yet. We are slowly updating those. Uh, but the dream is that all such modules will be able to use this callback mechanism in the future. And that means that new modules can live outside Gromax and just get called back every now and then. Uh, and you don't need to, to to worry so much about changes that happen within Gromax. If domain decomposition hasn't changed its implementation and you know it'll call you back the same way, life's good. You don't have to up change your, update your code to, to work with the new version of Gromax. The modules here also orchestrate the so-called halo exchange, where we need to make sure that uh, the domains make sure that particles that are within the region that are handled by neighboring domains can be shared each time step. And that's a necessary aspect for particularly the, the short range interactions that the Gromax is, is so efficient at computing, but also for a lot of the other modules like the, those that are computing the, the, the bonds and angles and dihedrals, they need to know about neighboring atoms as well, so do constraints, so module module. And so there's there's a way of making sure that you you, you get access to the, the the particles that are that are updated as you need. There's a particular structure that that uh, is unfortunately still in a legacy style called GMX Dom Deck T. Um, slowly getting updated with more functionality moved into classes. So we don't have this nasty state pile on top of each other, but it's big and complex. Uh, so it's going to take us a while. There is another data structure called the molecular topology. Uh, its declaration is in GMX and top T. It has an extremely similar hierarchical system to um, the system directive in the uh, input dot top where you are able to say to Gromax, hey, I want three copies of my protein and 14 copies of my ions and 1,050 copies of my solvent. All of that hierarchical organization is reflected in the structure of GMX M top T. So it's structured in terms of molecule types and atom types. And then to actually refer to any particular atom, you then have to loop through um, the declaration and system of what atom types come in what order. Um, so there's looping functionality built into that. So if you want to access atom 432, well, there's no API that allows you to do that. You can instead loop through all of the stuff that, and keep track of when you get to atom 432, and then you can do your thing with that. Uh, and that that makes a somewhat more tedious API than just indexing atom 432. Um, sometimes it makes sense to index for atom 432, either for simplicity or for performance. Um, so there are APIs you can call to write out a data structure. So aspects of Gromax has a fully written out topology, say, within a domain. Uh, so if you're writing a code that needs to in interact with the positions on the domain, then be aware there is a local topology uh, that, that has that written out. Um, and in some of the analysis, legacy, legacy analysis tools, we also have a fully written out data structure. Um, it is not maintained and will be broken without any notice. So don't plan to use it. Use the looping functionality, which will keep um, updating. But if you're potentially porting one of these legacy analysis tools, well, be aware that this, this other form of topology does exist. Um, and it's probably broken because it's not well maintained and not tested at all. There are a bunch of other important data structures in MD run. Um, there's the so-called function type or F type. Um, so different kinds of particle particle interaction types are described in a big table uh, that allow parts of Gromax to only handle constraints when it has to handle constraints, only handle bonded interactions if it's trying to handle bonded interactions. Uh, so all of those are, are described in a big table that that is an early early form of allowing the modules to to only do things that are related to each other. If you need to declare modules that have command line options, there's there's a way of doing that. Of course, it's not actually used by MD Run yet. It's mostly used by um, command line analysis tools. Um, but uh, there, there is a framework for declaring those to in the as part of the so-called analysis framework. Uh, T state I have mentioned contains all the data to do with the thermodynamic, thermodynamic state and little bits of algorithmic state that lets Gromax propagate MD. Uh, so uh, I won't go into details there, but you know things like pressure and temperature coupling have internal algorithmic state in some cases, and that gets maintained alongside. 
Unfortunately, because this is just a, a plain old struct, you don't have any promises about whether any of this data is self-consistent. Um, unfortunately, all of that is embedded in the the update code that you know, takes one part of the state and applies a mathematical operation to it to make a new part of the state. Uh, and so trying to work out a reasonable way to express that uh, in code that, that allows people to understand what the data means at any point in time is a work in progress. We, we have not grappled much with how to do that because we find that most people aren't changing much to do with, with uh, the update code. If you are changing things in the update code, be aware that there is a so-called modular simulator within Gromax, which does a much better job of um, self-describing where things are at in state and allowing you to change things in ways that, that can be understood, because this is a, a part of um, simulation research that, that is quite important within the Gromax community. We are hoping that in time, the modular simulator will replace the legacy simulator, but for now, not enough stuff is supported by the modular simulator. So it too is a work in progress in Gromax, and you need to be aware that there are both of these frameworks that you might run across. Sometimes you will get the advice from the core developers, hey, if you're going to develop this sort of stuff, do it in the modular simulator, because that's where things will end up eventually, and that's where you already have this thing to take advantage of. Uh, there's a set of interaction constants that contain a bunch of the parameters for evaluating non-bonded interactions. So those get written out from various other sorts of data structures that are most useful for, for things in the, the short range kernels. So if you're changing them, here's a sort of data structure you, you'll be handling. If you're working at a slightly higher level within a domain, um, TMD Atoms contains descriptions of domain contents if you're within a domain, or if you're only running a single domain simulation, well, it'll be everything. Um, but it contains fully written out things like masses and charges and whether this atom is within this sort of index group described in Grumpy P or not. A lot of those things make sense to be able to index on a per atom basis once you're in a high performance loop. So this TMD atom structure extracts from the local topology and the local and the, the input file and the, the domain decomposition, all of the particles that we currently have data for masses and charges, for example. So you don't have to go and spend a lot of time doing pointer chasing to find the charge of this particular particle. Because we know we're going to look up the charge thousands of times, we write that out so it can be indexed efficiently. But of course, that means next time we redo the domain decomposition, the MD Adams data structure has been outdated because now we have a different set of particles. The masses will be in a different order. Um, the charges will be in a different order. All this sort of stuff has changed. So. Um, you can't just keep a copy of the old one. You need to subscribe to the mechanism that allows you to make sure that you get a handle to the updated one because it all might have changed. Okay. Um, any questions about those high level bits of MDRUN? Up to now looks not, but okay. maybe I, I just ping everybody. Maybe. If, okay. We have a question. Uh, Sveta, I, I try to allow you to speak, please. Now you should be able to speak. Hello, am I audible? Yeah, we can hear you. Yeah. yeah thank you for unmuting me and uh, thank you uh, for this session. Especially, I am not a domain person, but uh, I work on for the application background. Like I uh, scale the things, I, and Gromax is my application on which I'm working on. So I scale Gromax. To, uh, I'm from India. I scale Gromax to the architecture or the things like AMD, Intel, and other things. I just have one question for this the previous thing which uh, you have been teaching, you are telling on to. You told about this .mdp and other input files. Uh, uh, can I uh, request you where can I get some uh, some input file which I can scale on to some petaflops or uh, other thousand number of nodes because these files which I get I can see on to go uh, data upset is very small and at present what I have seen is here I could able to scale Gromax till 105 to 110 nodes and on GPUs also I see a very lower scalability of Gromax so can you please help me in this thank you so that, that too is a great question for the, the round table later in the week. Um, yeah. We do occasionally hold um, tutorials about understanding performance on Gromax. So you, you can find some of those uh, on, on the web as well. Um, BioXL did some, I think you even 
will find yours truly speaking on them if you go and look in the the, the archives on YouTube. Um, there are sets of Gromax input files useful for running benchmarks. Uh, maybe one of my colleagues can can drop a link to one of those in the chat. There are more or less standard sets of those that are useful in particular use cases. Um, but the whys and wherefores of how Gromax scales is is not something I want to spend time on in this particular talk. But very much we can talk about some of those aspects in Thursday. Okay. Thank you. Uh, uh, so, uh, sorry, sorry Svetan, Svet could you type your question in the Q&A? So I put it uh, in agenda for Thursday for the round table, and I will post also on chat uh, on the chat uh, what the material that Mark was referring to. So you know oh, it. Sure. And uh, I please go ahead with your second question. I think you had it. Uh, yeah, thank you. No, uh, this question is not a as on such. I was just requesting Mark. Mark is like, uh, can you share uh, till what number or till how many number of cores this Gromax has been scaled on CPU and GPU? So we also try try the same at R and also. Hundreds of them. Um, Depends on the input, of course. You can't take a small amount of work and efficiently parallelize it to a large amount of computers, just like you can't do that with humans working on a project either. Um, sorry. Yeah. 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 Uh, yeah, I understand on that. Sorry, thanks, Mark. But the thing is, ki, uh, I have a smaller amount of input which I'm taking on to. But the thing is, ki, uh, I am not able to scale it on GPUs. CPUs, yes, I could able to get it. But um, can you refer me to some of the... Uh, database or some of the material where I can check and get the things working with Gromax on GPU as well. I'm, yes, we can. I'm, I'm, I'm posting it on Slack now. So you will see a link to it's another material where we have done a workshop on Lumi where you have also different type of input that you can use that we are used there for both CPU and GPU. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Sorry, Mark, to interrupt you, if you want to add something. No. All right, let's 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 continue on with the, the, the last section of um, internal interfaces in Gromax, for those of you who are um, planning on changing Gromax. Uh, these are some of the things that you'll, you'll need to be available, uh, need, need to be aware of. Um, so the idea of a software interface is, is a very important one. Um, it's not unique to software. Um, an interface is, is the surface that's available for use. The, the, when, if you have a mobile phone, the primary input you use is tapping on the screen. Um, and what that tap might mean depends on whether you have a keyboard popped up or whether there's a button on the screen you can push or whether you're moving something around in a drawing program. Um, how the software describes that interface is, is a very important part of how, how it gets made usable. And the same thing actually goes within the software. So we, we, we have interfaces and we spend a large amount of our time as developers thinking about how do I make sure this interview can be used well, um, either by a user in the, in the case of things like the MDP files that are the inputs for, for Gromp, and indeed within, within Gromax, how does the key value tree that describes the content of the MDP file, how can that be used by modules? The implementation, on the other hand, as the details below that interface, which are hopefully separated from it, that make it work. If you can get your job as a software developer or a user done only using the interface, then your project will be easier to, to achieve. It'll be less coupled. You'll have fewer problems keeping things uh, updated in the future uh, if, if you're able to depend only on the interface. So as, as one example, many of you have may have used Google Docs, and over time, you've accumulated a large number of documents. Google Docs has an API where you could write, write a command line instruction that says, look through all of my Google documents for the phrase, my job. Um, and it could go and look through all of those programmatically and tell you, ah, I found it in all of these places. Now, Google Docs provides helpful functionality that wraps that API as well. You can search through that, all that sort of stuff on Google Drive. Um, but you have the ability to write to an interface to get that job done as well. And so we as Gromax developers try to provide the same sorts of high level capabilities that you as a developer might want to use as building blocks 
Uh, and so some of those are available in our Python and C++ APIs. Um, so the interfaces to those are installed alongside Gromix and the implementations are built alongside Gromix um, so that they're, they're potentially available for you as a, as a user. There are only some sorts of Gromix extension projects that are amenable to using the stuff that's currently made available in a public API. Some of the reasons why the, the APIs are so limited are that we need to make sure that we've completed some of these internal evolutions uh, to using better structured interfaces internally so that we can then grapple with the problem of, of making a stable interface available externally. And so then only then can we achieve the nirvana of we can update Gromax internally so it runs on brand new GPUs and your module can sit outside Gromax and be a plugin and you don't even need to recompile to shift your work from an Intel GPU to an AMD GPU, for example. Uh, and so we're, we're, we're working slowly towards this agenda, or this, this nirvana, um, but uh, we're not here yet. So earlier I talked about the analysis for the analysis framework. Um, and so there's some links here to high level docs. And in here is part of those high level documentations where we talk about how an individual analysis module will get called by the runner um, to let it know that, for example, the command line options have been passed and now they've been finished and now it's time to do some analysis and here's a new analysis frame. So there's a whole workflow that the implementer of the analysis flow needs to understand. And so we, we've documented this, this workflow in this, this um, standard interaction diagram. Now, elsewhere, you can go and read up on the internet about what, what these arrows mean and how time evolves in, in a standard way in, in these interaction diagrams. I'm not going to go into that now, but do be aware that we have these sorts of things. So please go and look at the, the, the high-level documentation for uh, how, how things should flow. There's many examples of, of how this sorts of things should work. And so that is why we encourage authors and new authors to also go and use this framework. Talk to us if there's something you don't think you can do. Maybe you can, maybe you can't. We'll, we'll work on how to, to get things working. Uh, so that this interface is useful, so that we can have new new tools written by people over time and potentially contributed back once they're, they're working well and useful to a, a community of users. We have within MD Run uh, a framework for composing Gromax functionality. Some of the things within Gromax and all of the new things that have been contributed in recent years are, are part of this, uh, this framework. If you're looking to contribute to MD Run, you'll need to participate in, in this so that we don't keep adding to the problem of everything is legacy. Um, so it permits collaboration within modules and within the, the main infrastructure of the code with very lightweight dependencies uh, and gets done some of the, the things I'm talking about, how you can use lower level interfaces so that our dependency graph becomes less of a snarl and so that your software can, in the fullness of time, live outside Gromax and not need to, to be contributed to Gromax because that's that's nirvana for all of us that uh, we don't need to uh, contribute collaborate on so many things, people can get their work done and do their science much quicker if these interfaces can live outside Gromax. Um, so that these MD modules allow you to collaborate on common infrastructure things like getting your input values, writing output files, computing forces, receiving notifications after events and stuff. Vedra. Alessandra might need to unmute you. Yes, but I don't see, I don't see Vedram asking question. Okay, I thought it was her hand raised. Raise okay. your hand again if, if, if you want, Vedram. Vedram, do you have a question? I I really don't see from an interface. Okay. Uh, he, has a, he, has, he has a question, maybe you, can I mute you? No, no. In the interest no. of time, I'm going to move on if we can't yeah. see them. Yeah, 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 sorry. Please, please type a question if you, if you can do that. Um, so you can find the high-level docs on how these are wired together on that link there. As part of this modules framework, there's an interface that we touched on briefly earlier when I talked about the MDP files. This is the replacement to it um, that allows modules to declare that I want to get an MDP file parameter at grump time, and I want that serialized into the TPR file so that when MDR run starts, the infrastructure can read that from the TPR file and call me back with the values so that my uh, MD run code can get information about the MDP values and not need to worry about the, the low level details of actually parsing TPR files. Um, you can find some high level docs there. There's an example um, in, sorry, there's, there's, there's Doxygen documentation of how to use the, the particular components there. And here's an example in the QMM module. Um, 
So hint to one of the questions that got asked earlier. Um, Gromax does have QMM capabilities already. Go and, go and check those out online. Um, so here is the QMM options class that depends on this interface. So that will change very slowly over time. And then in the fullness of time, it'll even become part of Gromax's stable C++ API, I hope. Uh, and here are the, the different functions that it has to implement uh, in order to, to get its job done. Another part of the MD modules is the iForce provider because frequently people want to extend Gromax to say, oh, I want to be able to define an extra kind of forces. So the electric field module and the restraints module are two of the, the working examples we have for this. Um, QMM is also structured as a force provider uh, because ultimately all of those need a list of particles present on the domain and some sorts of internal data that got built earlier as to how those coordinates need to interact to produce force contributions, uh, and then the ability to add those forces to the force data structure. And that's where the iForce provider comes along, provides you an interface to say, okay, here, here are the forces I'm going to add. Um, let Give me somewhere I can put them so that the rest of Gromix can combine those forces in to the, the high-performance infrastructure uh, that, that handles coordinating CPUs and GPUs and what have you with the main decomposition each step. Now, you as a module author don't want to handle all of those details. You want to put your forces in a place that the infrastructure can know about. And I force provider is the way that we do that. At a somewhat higher level, you might want to write a piece of code that works a bit like MD run, but does something that is unrelated. So we use this interface internally for things like energy minimization, because that works a little bit like MD run, but totally differently in some other ways. Test particle insertion is another algorithm within Gromax that, again, works a little bit like MD run, but not entirely. Rerun is a classic example. Here we're reading in a file, and we're going to compute the forces on it, and we're going to write the forces out. But maybe we're doing something totally different than the forces we computed at actual simulation time. So you can provide a different TPR file, because if you want to evaluate your forces using a different flavor of your force field just to see what is different, um, maybe you're doing some sort of analysis that will be different. Rerun can be a, a really powerful way to quickly compute again some forces that correspond to the inputs that you have available uh, without needing to, to go to the trouble of writing custom code. So these don't even have to be a, a, a correspond to a time evolution. Um, you can just concatenate a whole bunch of random configurations that you generated some other way entirely. You can go and get Gromax's energies and forces if you want them. Um, so this works a little bit like MD Run, except instead of using the forces to compute updates of velocities and positions, we're going to get those from reading in another file. So historically, this got implemented in exactly the same place as MD run. And that meant it was really hard because we had, oh, if we're doing rerun, go do something different at this point. If we're doing regular simulation, go do something else. Likewise for, for energy minimization. And this all ended up being rather complicated. So we, we developed this interface so that people who want a tool that's doing something like MD run, but not doing MD run, has a place that it can live. Um, so this was quite useful when people came along wanting an interface to Gromax uh, for doing QMM, uh, where they just wanted Gromax to compute the MM forces. They wanted to handle all the other details of propagating MD themselves. That mean, that actually works pretty much like rerun. Rerun just gets coordinates from somewhere. In their case, it's a file, whereas in Mimic's case, it was from other MPI processes running on the same nodes. Uh, that we're doing the QM stuff. Um, they could just provide us with coordinates. We can provide them back forces. It worked basically the same as a rerun. So now Mimic lives outside Gromax. They update their end. They support CPMD in different ways. Time goes past. They don't change their interface within Gromax. They don't change their interface within CPMD. And they get to take advantage of all the changes within Gromax without needing to change anything inside Gromax. Um, so that, that's been a big success story for evolving this particular interface. There's examples there that I won't go into now because it's only rarely changed. There is also a, a notification framework within uh, Libgromix because various kinds of events need to happen at different times. You might need to have your module called back after uh, Gromp has passed the, the MD options. You might need to be called back after domain decomposition has happened during the simulation. This framework allows you to say, hey, I want to get this kind of information. When it's available, please call back this particular function into my module. That allows this collaboration to depend on 
low level interfaces and not be coupled to each other. Um, so this is this is allowing um, different kinds of modules to collaborate together without needing to know any kinds of implementation details of each other. So that in the in the fullness of time, we can make this available as part of a stable API and then your code can live outside Grovex entirely. Um, there's another interface for coordinating communication within Gromax where, particularly for computing things like uh, the potential energy or the kinetic energy, Gromax needs to combine values from different domains periodically within the simulation. But we don't need all of the modules at each step. And indeed, we don't do anything on most of the steps. Uh, and so one of the differences between Gromax and other MD packages out there is that we don't do this every step. So we can. Uh, be much more scalable because these unscalable things like coordinating communication between all of the running processes at once can happen infrequently and only deal with as much data as they need so that if it's not needed it, it doesn't work um, at all uh, so it'd be simplest if we just let every module do global communication itself but that will not be scalable and we need gromix to be scalable so that people can run big simulations on on lots of hardware uh, so there needs to be a framework within gromix that coordinates this module needs this amount of data on this frequency, but this other module needs different data on another frequency. Sometimes they'll both need to work together, sometimes they won't. And so the observables reducer is, is the new framework in Gromex that allows you to coordinate from this. So if you find your module is needing to do global communication somehow, you might benefit from, from considering how to use observables reducer for that. Certainly, if you want to contribute to Gromex and you're doing something similar to this, you'll be asked to, to rewrite your code using observables, observables reducer if you haven't already. So there's some links to, to the docs in the source. Uh, you can go look at those if that sounds like what you might be needing to do. Finally, some, some tidbits. Um, do go and look for those high level documentation in the, the .md files in source docs Doxygen. Um, you can find them with a web search, but if you want to make sure you're looking for the bits that correspond to the code you're editing at the moment, well, they live in the source code repository as well. Uh, this was a big improvement we made to Gromax about a dozen years ago, making sure that our docs lived with our source code so that people as users could make sure that the documentation corresponded to the source code. Otherwise, people frequently made changes to the source code and said, oh, yeah, when we do the release, I'll update the documentation. And then, of course, we'd make the release and it'd take them three months to find the time to write the new documentation. Um, in the meantime, people wanting to use it couldn't find any. Uh, so by making sure that we update the documentation with the code changes, everybody has a much better life. Um, in the MDP file, there are user-defined variables. Uh, they, they give you a very fast way to start using things within your module. I mean, you don't have to go delving into details of t-input rec or key value trees and stuff. Um, so I can recommend them. I started using them myself as a Gromex developer 15 years ago. Um, it was great for you know, being able to, I, I need an extra integer to describe what I'm doing. You can just get one um, from that framework that's already available. If you find yourself needing to find something interesting in the code, um, Git grep is very much your friend. Don't go and get Grown or Gromax's tarballs and start developing from that. Go and do the a source code checkout with Git. You get a whole bunch of extra value there, one of which is being able to go Git grep. And now you only look in the source code files that Gromax developers know are, are interesting. Um, so you can go and do a case insensitive search with the minus I flag for MDP options, and you will find all of the source code files that currently do things related to MDP options. So this is a good way to find all of the examples that exist, where the implementation is, if you need an implementation detail, but hopefully you can also find the interface to it uh, and, and can read that first. This is a fantastic way to find things. You might, you might be using an IDE that's also powerful for helping you find these things. If you have that support available and want to use it, that's great. Um, those, are, those are other tools that are available. There's a couple of hands-on exercises here. I, I won't take everybody's time at lunchtime to, to talk about what they are, but if you're looking to, to get your hands dirty doing a little something in Gromax and you know, want, want, want something that's achievable in, in a couple of hours, here are some ideas um, that, that, that I can share with you. Wonderful. Do we have any final questions before we break for lunch? Thank you very much, Mark. Great, great lecture. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs>